This is the 1966 Apollo guidance computer, the computer that flew in the Apollo spacecraft and guided the LEM to a moon landing. If you follow the restoration saga, you know that we got ours working just in time for the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. So in the nick of time, we are going on a tour on the East Coast to participate to some Apollo celebration events. We decided that the first person to see the demo would be no other than Eldon Hall, the father of the AGC. Eldon famously pushed the visionary decision to use the recently invented and completely unproven integrated circuit to build the AGC. We talked with Mr. Eldon Hall, Deputy Associate Director of the Instrumentation Lab. The guidance and navigation system consists of two measurement elements, controls, a computer, the computer display and controls. Eldon is now 96 years old and lives in Florida. He has kept several important historical artifacts about the AGC. Most famously, he gave Mike the schematics we were missing to restore it. But he also has some very early Block 2 prototype modules in a format I had never seen before. And most importantly, he has one core rope module that he is going to let us read after the demo. So these are these are just rope simulator boxes, but I'm using the I'm using the test connector uh, as a core rope simulator. Unfortunately, I could not attend the event set up at Eldon's condo. I'm told he was quite happy to see his old computer again. Mike flew a landing, and that worked perfectly with the real AGC, as we had expected. We ended the day by reading Eldon's core rope module. This rope should contain part of Sundance, which was flown on Apollo 9 and of which we have absolutely no record. Sundance 302 E4 dot game. This is the first time we have ever seen any code from Sundance whatsoever. Okay. Ooh, but we only have one sixth of the code? Yes. As Ken just pointed out, this is only one of six modules. But as you'll see later, we were able to archive two more Sundance modules later in the trip. You know, we can <laughs> still do analysis on this. We can disassemble it and look at how it should be quite similar to what's in luminary. Okay. Next stop on the tour was at the Cradle of Aviation Museum in Long Island, New York. They have lots of cool Apollo-related hardware there. Uh, so we're at the Cradle of Aviation Museum. This is the Lunar Module Simulator, the astronauts practiced in. Uh, so they've got their, their disk up there, and then there's a uh, model of the AGC back there, partial model. It looks like the, the LEM was downscaled, so there's not room for a real <laughs> So you can see that the AGC here is missing its connector pins. That's how you can tell it's fake. They had a full LEM simulator on display, including this very awesome console that controlled the whole thing. And this is Ken's favorite panel, the malfunction insertion unit, used to insert hardware folds to spice up the simulations. Our setup now even included a Lego LEM, rigged up with little LEDs that light up when the thruster is fired by the AGC. And of course, many AGC landings were flown throughout the day for visitors of the museum. But our biggest event was to happen right at the birthplace of the AGC in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The MIT Museum was organizing a special lunar day for the anniversary of the moon landing and we were one of the featured attractions. It's a dinosaur, no, it's a robot made by some clever MIT people. Uh, but besides all that, they had some really interesting Apollo hardware. The initial measurement unit, boy do I want one. A gyro, I already have one. And this is the control panel for the alignment optics for the guidance uh, system the telescope and the sextant with all the AGC words and nouns on it. 
the very listing of Luminary 99, we used to recompile the original Apollo 11 landing software, which we are flying in a demo. A disk key recently donated by Don Isles. And yes, even an AGC, or half of one, the tray B to be exact. And I even got to wheel down and install a moon rock brought back by Apollo 16, which was the star of the exhibit. Uh, besides us, that is. From the white color, I suspect this is an orthosite, a primordial rock that established that the moon was formed from a part of the Earth after a very large impact which is one of the major scientific discoveries from the Apollo exploration. Uh, I'm Debbie Douglas, I'm the Curator of Science and Technology and the Director of Collections at the MIT Museum. I'm the lucky person that gets to steward a million and a half objects but one of the most um, precious, and certainly this week, uh, most um, uh, interesting objects that we have in our collection is uh, the Apollo guidance computer. Debbie graciously agreed to let us take a closer look at their AGC. Of great interest to us, this AGC also has a full set of rope modules that we will try to read to recover the original software, once again a program that had been lost to history. The other half is on display uh, at uh, Draper Laboratory right now. Um, where, where it was born, right? Uh, yeah, it's, 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 well, it's, yes, although it's this it's machine was born in a different building altogether. But where you are sitting right now actually was also part of the instrumentation laboratory. And the instrumentation lab did a lot of the gyroscope testing uh, in this particular building that were, was part of the inertial measurement unit. And when we flip the unit, uh, we can finally see the rope module we hope to recover. Uh, this is Sundial E, the command module system test program, which only takes three modules. Uh, three, so, so what, what does it have for? Oh, we had to use a jumper. Yeah, you need the fixed jumper. So yeah. that's this one? Yep. So it should be a complete Yeah, so th these program. four are a complete set. And we don't have Sundial E anywhere, right? right? This would be the first time we... Yep, so we have zero the... revisions of Sundial. This is the same series as ours? I, this might be our sister AGC. From the part number on the alarm module, it looks like this might be dash uh, 081, maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, which would be the AGC that went under vacuum testing in the command module uh, in oh. Houston versus well, well, ours. Well, ours rather them. So this, would, this might be the command module part of... It, it might be. Here we go. Mike thinks this is the sister AGC to ours, used during the man rating of the command module and the LEM in Houston. Ours was in the LEM and this one was in the command module. Mike thinks he can tell for sure if he manages to find a serial number hiding somewhere on the chassis. What's the riddle, Mike? Uh, which AGC is this? <laughs> All right. And <laughs> how, how are you going to figure it out? Uh, we can narrow it down a lot. I don't know if we can positively identify it. Um, mm. But if the wired assembly number for tray B here mm -hmm. it has a dash 031 at the end, uh, that'll get us down to, as far as I can tell, one of two AGCs. Either serial number 8, which was actually originally in LTA-8, uh, or uh, originally destined for LTA-8. Ours replaced it later on. Oh, really? Uh, but since it has command module ropes in it, it's much more likely to be our sister AGC, right. you know, the one that was in uh, the command module that underwent thermal vacuum During, testing during the, the man rating, the yeah. test. And you think the number is hidden behind the memory module? Yeah, it's I can see the first half of it, but the dash number is right behind the screw of the erasable memory module. All right. <laughs> There you go. 2003063-011. And this is our AGC? Yeah, this picture is from our AGC. And it still has a dash 011 here. Okay. So the, the 031 would be printed somewhere else. The exquisite NASA drawings have tables that match a particular AGC with the serial number of its parts. Using this as a decoding table, Mike hopes to find the true identity of this AGC. He's looking for a telltale dash 031 number. Hey, dash 031. 
All right, so this is a dumb very expected in the actual stream one. Yep. I believe looking at the configuration drawings that this would narrow it down to one of three computers, uh, with ours being Ooh. one of those three. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's really close. Serial number eight being another one, uh, but serial number eight was originally used in Guidance System 602 for a linear module. Uh, this has a uh, sundial command module ropes in it, uh, which is what the command module would have had, had in during in the vacuum testing. Right. Uh, so I think this is, it's, it's very likely that this AGC is the one that went with our AGC. Uh, and was so you have a LEM and this would be the command module? Yeah. Yep, and, and they would have been in the vacuum chambers at the same time in Houston. Cool. <laughs> well, well done, Sherlock. But how do you know about them? Elementary, my dear Watson. Yes, that's, that's really interesting. After Mike's brilliant identification of the AGC, we proceed to remove the rope modules in order to read them in our own AGC. So each module has the... Okay, yes. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Got it. One... And then, and then there's a label right yep, here. Yep, I see. So One, two, three, four, so got it. Five, so we can make six. sure they get the right module in the right slot. Yep. So we go for dump. Sundial E. Okay. Ready? I'm ready. Yeah. Bing, bing. It's still doing it. Yeah. There we go. So let's take a look at what we got. Yeah, we're doing sanity checks. So here's the data. Data looks good, so we might as well try to run the program straight from the ropes in our AGC as it did over 50 years ago during the man rating test. But well, we can run it off the rope modules right yeah, now. Yeah, how we do that? Now you'll see it actually execute from the rope modules. There it there is. You go. All right, so we just got the software, the ropes running on our computer and it's working on the real fake disk key. And it's passed seven tests. Oh, it has passed everything? One, one? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have a perfectly healthy computer and perfectly healthy ropes. Carl, can you? get us through the setup. Sure, so for the demonstration we start with the Apollo Guidance computer. We have this connected up through Mike's test monitor to his control station to make sure everything's going well um, and then to the simulation and this other large connector is taking all of the the signals that would normally go throughout the spacecraft and routing them to this big panel where we can interface them to the display keyboard and other parts. In front is my disk which will be displaying the the output and the interactions with uh, with Mike as he runs the mission, and then here we have a uh, Lego lunar module that has LEDs on it, and it's going to light the LEDs will light as the AGC commands, different thruster movements, and the engine bell will light up as the descent engine goes on. So the when President Kennedy committed the country to um, Project Apollo, it was a commitment to. Uh, take people to the moon, land on the surface, and bring them back safely. And frankly, at the time the commitment was made, it was really on the edge of impossible. So, so I want to talk a bit about what makes the Apollo Guidance Computer such a revolutionary system. So they made the, a big bet on integrated circuits. Now, integrated circuits had just been invented four years earlier, and they you know, bet the whole Apollo project on them. Uh, it only had the equivalent of four kilobytes of RAM, and 72 kilobytes of, of ROM storage. And so, you know, with all this very limited memory, somehow they made it to the moon. So, so we're going to start uh, at um, what's called Power Descent Initiation, or PDI. Um, um, once we get down to about 10,000 feet, uh, the computer's going to switch into Program 64, uh, pitch forward so the astronauts can see the landing site. And then once we get down low, uh, there's two, technically three, uh, but practically two options for landing. Uh, program 65, which is uh, completely automatic control by the AGC, and uh, Program 66, which is like a semi-manual uh, mode, uh, which is what I'm going to be flying and what they flew on Apollo 11. Our pilot today is Mike Sturt. Uh, besides knowing every gate in the AGC, uh, he's also an accomplished LEM pilot. And you will see actually we have the outputs, the fire, uh, the thrusters output wired to this NASA approved LEGO version of the LEM. We, we couldn't find a real one. 
and uh, it has little lights on it. So every time the AGC pushes, a uh, no, ac actuates the thruster, it will it will glow red. This is a quite close reenactment of Apollo 11. We are using the same computer, the same software, but once again, the LEM is a simulation, but it responds to the command of the uh, of the AGC, the Apollo kind uh, of computer. So the computer here flies the whole thing. So uh, first step here, which would have done been done much earlier in the real mission, is to turn on our computer. This <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the first thing I'm going to do here is start program 63. Verb 37, enter, 63, enter. And now uh, we are waiting for uh, ignition minus 7.5 seconds, which is when the, uh, the haulage burn uh, with the, the uh, reaction control thrusters that settles the fuel in the tanks uh, will start. So Neil Armstrong called engine arm, they called Bullage. Yeah, bullage. And then flash in verb 99. I press proceed to confirm ignition. Pro. 10%. Yep, and there's 10% throttle. So that's a momentous time, right? We are leaving orbit, and now our trajectory is intersecting with the moon surface. So if we don't control it, we crash. <laughs> he does that. Watch how his movement on the stick corresponds to the firing. And he's going to command a constant troll, so he's going to move all the way to the right. But it's go only going to light the thruster for a little bit. Because the computer understands it just wants to roll at concentrate, so it just needs to kick the movement. Then it won't do anything until it brings it back to the center and it will kick it in the other direction. So it's fly by wire, right? It's a computer in between you and the thrusters. There we go, and we see the thrusters, yeah. So watch the ball on the right. Mike is going to get it to 90 degrees. So notice no activity on the thrusters. I'm going to revisit. We're going to have a few checks. There you go. Throttle down. Throttle down on time! Exclamation point. <laughs> so they were uh, once again very worried whether the AGC was controlling the thing as uh, they had tons of other communication problems and data problems and they were very very reassured by that one. So there's P64 and now we are pitching forward and I can see my landing site. Uh, yeah, and it looks like we're flying fine. Uh, so right now my landing site's right about here, at 5950. I'm going to push forward a couple times to redesignate me forward. Program alarm. Uh, but I got a program alarm. Verb 05 now, 09, enter. It's, it's a 1202. <laughs> Houston, give us a reading on the 1202. You're going on that 1202. <laughs> so kind of, kind of not. This is a catastrophic failure. The computer just restarted in front of your eyes. So <laughs> there the, the, is the, the a hardware malfunction in the radar, and it overwhelms the computer, giving it false uh, data. Uh, but the, in their infinite wisdom, the people at MIT... Oh, there's another one. Oh, another 1202. So the people at MIT has programmed the computer so yeah. it was checkpointing, so it could restart and continue where it left off. And that basically saved the mission. And I'm still waiting for that feature on Windows. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm going to flip into attitude hold and then press my rate of descent switches uh, to slow my descent. So I have gone into program 66. Uh, and now have uh, somewhat manual control over the flight here. So, call on the ground would be, attitude hold, we better stay quiet now. So they immediately see that Neil Armstrong has got manual, he was going to land in the field of boulders, he doesn't want that. So he has taken over and is moving really fast, so they immediately know he's in a pickle. And Gene Kranz says, from now on, you only announce fuel and it's still quite not to distract him. And now it's rely relying on the skill of the pilots, the pilots, not easy. So if he's an ace pilot, one minute, that's all the fuel he has to go to land. I'm going to slow my rate of descent a little bit here. Watch Picking the blue up. light at the top. Picking up dust. Picking up dust. Two and a half down. One and a half down. 14 feet, oh, and then stop, you see, you got a detent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, uh, Neil, you have something to say at this moment? Uh, 
uh, Houston uh, Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. Well, after his bomb. <laughs> So now we've made it on the moon, thanks to the incredible pilots and the incredible AGC. And of course in the simulation we cannot do an EVA. And then we look outside the window and there is no Starbucks, so it's a very inauspicious, inauspicious place. So we decide to simulate an abort instead and go back home. So, so I'm going to press the abort stage button. And we're off. So they, they designed this to be as safe as possible. Uh, at any point during the landing, I can press abort stage, and regardless of my switch positions, uh, like if you look at uh, my buttons over here, I have the engine stop button pushed in. I don't have any engines armed. It doesn't care. If I press that abort button, it's going to get me out of here and back into orbit. Right, so from now on, the AGC is completely in charge yep. and will get us back into orbit and then my colleagues will rescue us. <laughs> so we're going to end the demonstration here and oh, ladies and gentlemen, our ace pilots. <laughs> Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. Back on Earth, few were more nervous than a young computer programmer who had written the code for the lunar landing. We were landing on the moon the first time. It's not surprising there were problems. Uh, my name is Don Isles. I wrote a good part of the computer code for the onboard computer that was active during the lunar landing phase of the Apollo mission. Yes, um, Mike, this is uh, Denise, I mean, Dana Dinsmore, who worked on a lot of operating system stuff. Yeah. Uh, Peter Adler, yeah, who uh, did, oh, you did? Yeah. Uh, did the P-40s, the other powered flight phases. Uh -huh. uh, here's Sharon Albert, who uh, helped with the landing and some other things. And you probably have already, you've already met Hugh Blair Smith. Yes. We, 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 know, uh, we know you hope from Don's book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> For better or worse. Tell us what you, what you brought. I have a couple of uh, core rope modules. We don't know for sure what program they relate to. Each of these is about 12 kilobytes of uh, very reliable memory. And this weighs about a kilogram. And you have the ability to read them and find out exactly what's on them. Yep. And I'll be looking forward to finding that out myself. Hopefully we'll be able to tell you tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> do, do, do you have an idea, Mike, of what's uh, on them? I suspect it's uh, I think Sunburst 302, or one of them is anyway. I think they're both Sundance. Uh, okay. One is 302, one is 306, yeah. I think. And then and then you got the third Sundance module from Elden earlier this week, right? Yes. <laughs> so we would have like... Yeah, we'll have half of the software. Half of it. With one revision, one of the modules that is slightly different revision from the other two. <laughs> uh, okay, well, we'll let you figure Figure all that out. Uh, yep. Mike, uh, uh, Hugh Blair Smith. Hey, nice to meet you in person. I wanted to be able to congratulate you in person on doing this heroic thing here. Thank you. <laughs> and following you on You did the heroic thing. <laughs> 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 And on our last day, we attended a reunion of the Draper Labs people that work on Apollo. They had this great caricature of Doc Draper, the inventor of inertial navigation, and even his car, driven by his son. There was, of course, great photo taking of uh, all the veterans, and uh, even a recreation of a famous picture of the five programmers that did the famous hack on Apollo 14 that basically saved the mission. And it's nice to see them alive and kicking, and in particular to hear the stories. It was hard to record in the noise, but I caught a few.
concept was this instruction simulator would go instruction by instruction. And I remember, you know, computing equations of motion and it looked exactly like the textbook. Right. Uh. It was very wow. difficult to code because we were in the punch card. <laughs> right. How fast was that? Is it, it sounds like it might be slower than slower. real time. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> not even slower. <laughs> Don't forget, we were running the IBM 360. Right, yeah. And which, which model? 75. Okay. Yeah, that's a big we one went, at the time. Right? We worked really hard. We could get two simulations running simultaneously. Just we trying. We maxed it out, basically. Yeah. So, uh, and these simulations would take hours. So is the is the code still somewhere that we could have it? Uh, if the lab backed it up somewhere and kept it, I don't know about it. Why, why the Malco pins? What, why, what drove your choice? Because we had my, my company, Samtech, we make connectors. Well, one thing, we looked at those, and those look funny. But you know, they're hellish and unreliable. And they were made by a machine shop on the west side of Chicago. And this guy had walked in, walked into the Pentagon. And there's a walk to Pentagon, this guy up in Chicago, and showed him these kids. He said, those are neat. And we'll use those in the ground-based electronics for the Polaris. Now, the Block 2, that was really different because Nobody had really done surface mount before. And I knew what he did, what? Surface mount. So, uh, so, yeah, yeah. They were, they were yeah, yeah. And the real problem was I needed a circuit board that had five varied layers. Oh, yeah, we were. A power, ground, and three signals. We were so impressed by that, that you had five layers. They, had, they had not existed. One of the guys at the lab hey, I heard about somebody down in Falls Church, Virginia, who's been making thick boards for the uh, Minimap. Uh, uh, go down and take a look. And so what I did not want is to have a very plated through hole. So there there are very there, there's only one plated, all plated through hole come to a pad on the surface. A lot later I was talking about I was consulting for a company that was having you know, a motherboard, computer board. I happened to take one of the log I had a logic project, so they might want to see that. I took it down there and they looked at that and they when was this? Yeah, I thought about 65, 64. You gotta be kidding. So we have the Don Isles book signed by Don Isles. Yay! Yes. Those are my Elden Hall books signed by Elden. Can, can, can you show the, the cover? Actually? 